Tonight, what is Australia's place in this new world order? Our alliance with the US and UK is alienating us from China and other powers. Will the move pay off or have we lost our way? Welcome to q and Welcome to the program, I'm Stan Grant and we're coming to you live from Sydney tonight and as you can probably hear from that clapping, I'm thrilled to welcome back our studio audience. <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't been the same without you and we're thrilled to have you back in the room. Now joining me on the panel, Director of the China Policy Centre, Yun Jiang, Nine News Political Editor, Chris Yulman, Shadow Minister for Industry and Innovation, Ed Husick, in Canberra, international relations expert, Lavina Lee. And in Melbourne, Victorian Liberal Senator, James Patterson. It's great to have all of them here. <laughs> now, today is, of course, Remembrance Day, and we'd like to acknowledge the sacrifice of others as we now wonder about our place in this rapidly changing world. Remember that you can stream us as well on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please join the debate and we'll publish your comments on screen from Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Let's go to our first question tonight. It comes from Pravind Iswar. Hi. So, so this morning, the US and China surprised the world by announcing a joint declaration on combating climate change. Mm. This joint declaration came about through several secret meetings over the past few months. So therefore, my question is, does this joint declaration signify a fundamental change in the relationship between these two superpowers? who up to now have been fundamentally opposed in the areas of security, trade and technology. Thank you for that, Praveen. Yun. No, I don't think it signifies a fundamental change in the relationship between the two great powers. It is a great sign that the two countries are able to cooperate on this global challenge that is climate change. But unfortunately, uh, with the global balance of power the way it is, the tension and the competition will still be there. However, I think it is, uh, I think uh, from Australia's perspective, it is great that we can see them cooperate. Lavina, is this a positive sign though? You know, we've, it's been a bruising few years, hasn't it? You go back to the trade war, of course, between the US and China, and we've had um, tensions over the South China Sea, tensions over Taiwan, ramping up of language. Does this offer the, the, the slight opportunity here of some greater rapprochement? Uh, I'd hate to be a dampener on things before they've ever even begun. But you will. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I think at the moment um, it's, it's more of symbolic, symbolic value than it is um, in terms of substance. So there's very little detail there about what the deal involves. Um, now, I also think that um, a key part of the US-China competition is that it's a tech competition. And China views uh, emerging technologies in the environmental space as being part of that tech, tech cooperate competition. So I'm really um, struggling to see how um, they can both compete aggressively, but also cooperate on these emerging technologies. Mm. So I'm a, I'm a bit sceptical about where, what, where this is going to be, go. Chris, even though there's been a, a, a bit of a, a frosty period of relations and a lot of rhetoric, there's still been ongoing contact at a really senior level. And now with, with this, is that do you take away some sign of, of a, perhaps a bit of a shift here or is it too soon? I think it's too soon to tell and might I say that in 2014 Barack Obama and Xi Jinping signed something that sounded very, mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm and we know what came after that. I was at COP26, I was at the G20. The thing that was the big story there wasn't Australia and France, it was the fact that China and Russia didn't go to either of those events. They sent their delegations, but their leadership did not go. There can be no solution to climate change without China being involved and the United States. Let's hope that that 
there, that is the case. But I thought the most telling intervention at the G20 was by, by Sergei Lavrov, the foreign mm. minister from Russia, uh, when he was asked why they weren't signing up to 2050 by an Italian journalist. And he said, what's magic about this 2050 number? You cooked up this agenda at the G7 and served it to us at the G20. And that's not the way that we're going to play this particular game. I think that what we saw this time around was a disconnect of Russia and China from the world order as it stands, because they want to remake it, and, and perhaps rightly so, uh, in, in the image and likeness of something that suits them better. Mm. Well, I agree that uh, currently there's not enough substance to the pledge, but um, we can see that there is a domestic drive within China to mm. do more on climate change. It's not just about uh, looking good on the international stage. From China's perspective, its domestic messaging is that Climate, combating climate change and reducing emissions is necessary for the sustainability of the Chinese nation. So it goes back to what Xi Jinping has saying, saying about you know, the common prosperity, about the future of the Chinese nation. So it's not just about looking good on the international stage, but a domestic drive. So on that, I think we can see more actions from China on climate change. J James Patterson, does this not at least from China's side, say China is being recognised here by the US as a country of perhaps even equal standing that it needs to do a deal with to deal with something that both sides have recognised as an existential crisis. Well, Stan, when it comes to emissions, China is much more than an equal uh, to the United States because it is the world's largest emitter and, emitter and by some margin, and of course the United States is the second largest emitter. Uh, China has been increasing their emissions every year up until this year and will do so for a number of years yet. And if we are to have any hope in reducing global carbon emissions, it will require China to do so. So the Australian government certainly welcomes uh, this initiative, uh, but we're closely scrutinising how it's implemented in practice because at the end of the day, the planet pays on results, not on promises, and we have to very closely scrutinise that. Of yeah. course, let's not forget that China also has the biggest population. As it, well. it, and, and per capita, Ed, the US is still the biggest, a, a bigger emitter than China, and of course, historically, the US has been a bigger emitter than China. But what do you take away from, from this? Is it a potentially more of a, of a breakthrough? Well, is two, there something to build two on? Two things. First, I, I can't let that comment go. The Morrison government that took a, pam a pamphlet to Glasgow is going to uh, look at the detail of what is in this deal when they're unable to put detail themselves about what they're doing in emissions, um, I think is laughable, first point. Second, uh, I, I think obviously people will want to test naturally what this agreement means, right? But there is a degree of significance about it. As you put in your question, a lot of this has been happening behind closed doors for some time. Uh, we know that America is taking this seriously and that they need to move on this. Um, we have... China has already announced in some of their BRI investments that, from what I, I understand, they won't fi uh, now finance uh, coal-fired power. But they've got a big job internally, as has been indicated. They've got a big job internally because they... And as James has said, their emissions are still looking to go one way and that's got to be dealt with. But what we have here... Let's not walk away from this. We have two of the big economies of the world, two of the big emitters of the world, who've managed to put aside their difference to try and make a difference, at least on climate change. So that's a start. But I agree we've got to see how this all mm. plays out. Our next question comes from Meg Truella. Thank you, Grant. Hi, Yesterday, Paul Keating addressed the National Press Club and questioned why Australia is, and I quote, running back to Cornwall to find security in Asia. How could Australia support China's growing power due to our geographic proximity without in turn supporting its increasingly authoritarian ideologies? Chris Yulman. Well, I don't know how you go about doing that. I heard Paul Keating yesterday and I thought that he gave us a very interesting geography lesson on the 20th century. Uh, we're in the 21st century and we're in a conflict already. We're in an information war which is happening right now. Thousands of cyber attacks every week against Australia, tens of thousands every year, some of them sponsored by the Chinese state, in fact, a lot of them. The university, which uh, one of our representatives comes from tonight, their computer system was compromised. The Bureau of Meteorology was compromised. Mm. The Australian Parliament was compromised. And all of those attacks came from China. We're already in a conflict. 
at the moment. And we have to start thinking about it in 21st century terms, not in 20th century terms. And I don't believe that Australia, as Paul Keating has said, since the 1990s, I do recall it, has sought to find its salvation away from Asia. It's been part of the Asia Pacific. Bob Menzies, in one of the most courageous acts in Australian political history, in the shadow of the war, invited a Japanese delegation to come to Australia and sign a trade agreement at a time when members of his government had got, been... He also got a well-known yeah. nickname out of that, didn't he? Sorry? Yeah. He also got a well-known nickname he, he, out he of that. He got Pig Iron Bob, but, but, but he, he, he signed that agreement in the shadow of the Second World War, when members of his government had been interned in, com in, in prison camps. Uh, that was the beginning of Australia's post-Second World War engagement with Asia. So it didn't start in the 1990s. James Patterson, um, the question, though, goes to this idea of why we keep running to the Atlantic or why we keep looking to powers such as the UK when our geography, and Paul Keating had made this point, our geography is Asia and the preponderant power of this region um, is China. Why do we keep looking to... Chris is talking about the 20th century, to 20th century powers in a 21st century world. Well, Stan, I think it makes sense that in a 21st century world with instantaneous communication that we would seek to form close partnerships with countries wherever they are in the world that share our values. And obviously the United Kingdom and the United States don't just have shared values but shared history. But to say that that's all that we're doing to secure our security is totally wrong. And it's like Paul Keating is unaware of the development of the Quad or the fact that it's been upgraded to the leaders' level uh, under this Prime Minister's leadership. And in fact, he in instead he denigrated our two most important important uh, security partners in the region, India and Japan. His great vision for Australia in Asia was that we would seek security in Asia rather than from Asia. Well, we are seeking security in Asia with partners like India and Japan, and all he can do is be negative about that and denigrate it, and I think it reflects very poorly on him. Ed Husey, Paul Keating didn't spare the Labor Party either, or Penny Wong, in saying that there is nothing that separates the Labor Party's position on this from, from the government's position. Do you, do you think he's right? Well, I, what I liked out of the speech yesterday, here we are saying the great thing about our country is a vibrant democracy can be able to have, you know, challenging ideas and that we can test where we go and we can have this difference of opinion. And then after he gave his speech, it felt like so many people had jumped on their chairs. I mean, well, it well, is the, not bad. The, 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 point, the point he made Wait about Labor was that you are not having before you that, that let context. Before you finish my point, so um, uh, the point that I did want to make is that I, I don't have a problem if he... You know, I think what's valuable about what he did is he injected some other points of view into this. You don't have to agree with everything he said, but as someone who has invested of himself and in terms of the Labor legacy from Whitlam, Hawke and Keating to engage with China, one, and two, um, to ensure that in terms of Asia as well, that we uh, make, and what I thought was important with what he said, was that we can make a bigger future as well for ourselves, sitting on the cusp of 600 million people in ASEAN. And it seems like the major engagement that the Coalition has in this space when it comes to, to Asia is to sign a trade agreement that, and that's it. There oh, doesn't sorry, seem to be... Sorry, sorry, I'm, 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 sorry, sorry I'm, James. Okay, quickly. just quickly. Yeah. Just quickly. This week, Australia signed the first ever comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN. No other country in the world has that. We did it this week. Mm -hmm. So, Ed, I just don't think you're up, mm -hmm. up to date with what's happening. Took, took eight years. They've only we're had the first partial, in the world. We're the first interest. country in the world. Others have tried and they've failed and we've succeeded and we should be very proud of that. It, and you it, shouldn't talk down that achievement no, no, of our no, no, country. No. Let's be clear about this. I'm talking you guys down. I'm not talking the country down. I'm talking down a coalition's neglect of the Pacific where it cut foreign aid once it came in to power. Uh, and, and has not really fully restored it and only rushed back in because it's the foreign imperative to do to, so. To, to the contrary, Hang we've refocused our aid right program second, to the Pacific no, from the rest of the world where it was under your either, leadership. Either I'm going to be able to finish we the point or he's going to well, jump okay. in. Okay. Well, you, you jumped you've in mine, so... You've, you've <laughs> made, you've made <laughs> your point, James. Let Ed finish and I want to come back they, and they, question they Ed about the original point that Kevin made. They created a void in the Pacific. They've neglected ASEAN. And they've preferenced making domestic political points in terms of China at a time where we need to have a very clear view about where we're going. China is a different country from where it has been. From that 49 to 78 period, from 78 to the middle of last decade, to what we've got now. And it's going to need a commitment to work together on this, have a very clear view about our strategy, 
to be able to uh, prioritise our national interests, human rights, and ensure that we're not the victim of economic coercion. This is going to take a lot of work. It doesn't need us chasing headlines okay. all the time. OK, and Paul Keating, when you talk about talking down, Paul Keating talked down Labor's performance and Penny Wong's performance and says that in the context of ideas, you're not providing an alternative. Is he right? I, look, I would like to say that I think, in terms of Penny's contribution uh, to our party and the parliament, um, I am a huge admirer of her work. I don't necessarily agree with everything that, that Paul says, and I certainly have a different view to him, and I'm a very big fan of Penny's. And what she's trying to do is ensure that we're able to project a position with respect to our party mm. uh, that, as I said, prioritises national interest, allows us to be able to speak up on human rights, and doesn't get driven by the need to be beating our chest, making a point for the sake of getting local headlines or scoring local domestic political points. L Lavina, just go, to go back again to, to the question here, and the question is, can we support China's growing power, or in Paul Keating's words, acknowledge and recognise and respect that power for what it is in the world, without at the same time um, supporting an increasingly authoritarian regime? That's the line we're having to walk right now. Is it possible to do that? Look, I, I think when you... Um listen to Paul Keating, he's got a very benign view of China that's based on a 1970s assessment of its foreign policy objectives. So um, I think that that's a, a, a kind of wrong basis from which to act. And the, the point to make about Asia is that Australia is not an outlier here. Um, China is the only dissatisfied power um, in Asia, in the region. It is revisionist. Um, it has expanded its ideas of what its territorial um, borders are. It used to be satisfied uh, with consolidating control over its land borders in Xinjiang and Tibet. And now it, it sees the South China Sea and the East China Sea as part of its, its natural territory and seeks to permanently uh, to be pre permanently present there and assert those territorial claims against other states. So I think um, actually what Australia is doing is um, through things like AUKUS, and yes, he, t he terms it going back to the <coughs> Anglosphere, but the fact remains is that we have a strong alliance with the United States and the United Kingdom, and we should, um, by all means, use those alliances to build our capabilities. Mm. And the problem is not so much uh, not giving due deference to China, but I think that the problem is um, that China is not giving due deference to the interests of other countries in the region. And um, other countries in Asia, including Southeast Asia, are actually looking to us to play a part in deterring and balancing China, to send it a signal that there are costs associated with that type of expansionist behaviour and perhaps it will um, reconsider uh, the way it behaves. Well, I just you, want to make yeah. an interesting observation that when we look to the United States or United Kingdom, we talk about our history with these countries and uh, I think Peter Jennings also said the kinship with these countries. I think it's a, it's a, it really reflects uh, the state of foreign policy debate in Australia. Um, we know that, for, for example, the First Nations people of Australia have a very strong historical connection to Asia and a lot of people uh, in Australia are from Asian origins, they have relatives in Asia. Yet when we talk about history, when we talk about kinship, we only talk about United States and United Kingdom. I think that really reflects the fact that the foreign um, policy establishment in Australia is very much dominated by uh, white people, basically. Uh, we look at think tanks, the head of think tanks, we look at our parliament, it is all very white. So people only think of Australia in terms of a white history. And then coming back to the question of what can we do about China. Yes, it is increasingly authoritarian. Um, they are cracking down on civil societies, including, you know, feminist activists, uh, LGBT group activists, um, and they're trying to uh, basically outlaw all alternative history. There can only be one version of history uh, that, can, that is accepted in China. But what we can do is to be consistent on our principles, uh, hold really dear, hold on to our liberal values. Uh, we should call out human rights abuses by China, and we should call out human rights abuses in India or in Israel. 
uh, everywhere there's human rights abuses, we should be consistent. We should not only call out human rights abuses when it's by China. Um, that consistency will be good for us. I'm, I'm glad you raised history because it does go to our next question. It comes from Colin McGregor. Hi. During the opium wars of the mid-19th century, Britain used its naval power to leverage trade and other concessions from China. Will the acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines with their longer range help or hinder our trade with China and the nations of the Asia-Pacific region, given that China is now a major naval power? Thanks for that question, Colin. Um, there's two parts to that, of course, and obviously we'll get to the submarines in just a minute, but Yun, can we just go to this question of history and the opium wars? And we hear this a lot, and it's referenced a lot in China, and it relates to what we hear a lot about the hundred years of humiliation. Xi Jinping references the opium wars a lot. Why? Why does it still cast such a shadow? It is a fun, almost like a foundational myth of the country. It is, I guess, relates to a bit like similar to Anzacs in Australia. Um, it is cast on upon us a history that basically made the country. It, opium war is like a dividing line between modern China mm. and ancient China, imperial China. Um, it cast uh, suddenly China has thrown into the world. It, it has become bullied according to uh, the, I guess, the, 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 the one history by the Chinese Communist Party. Ever since the Opium War, um, China has been subjected to uh, external coercions. Um, Japan has also invaded China and uh, there's an alliance of eight countries that basically has uh, raided China's uh, cities and took away its treasures. And that is to drum up, that sentiment is then being drummed up to increase, to inflame nationalism inside China. Now, nationalism is, of course, not only used by China either. You know, in a lot of countries, there's the victim discourse as well. And uh, we really should acknowledge that these things happen. For example, um, there's a dispute also between, historical dispute between Korea and Japan. Mm -hmm. And I think it's too simplistic for us to just say, get over it. Um, this is their foundational myth, just like we have our own myth. Lavina, does this go some way to explaining why China appears to be so overly sensitive, some would say paranoid, um, the constant references to foreign interference or foreign domination, and why, when it comes to submarines, China has seen this as an aggressive, hostile act? Um, look, I think we always have to be careful um, with the Chinese Communist Party's rhetoric. I think just as, as many countries use nationalism for their own domestic uh, purposes, I think the Chinese Communist Party has also magnified this rhetoric of a century of humiliation um, to suggest that only the Communist Party can restore China to its, its natural place at the centre of Asia. Now, of course, there's a contradiction there as well in that their own narrative is all about being bullied by outside powers, yet its current behaviour is about bullying other smaller countries in its neighbourhood, including Australia. So, um, really, uh, there's, a, there's a real inconsistency there. And when it comes to the submarines, um, I'm not sure if I, I fully followed the, the question um, that was asked. Well, well the, if... the, the, the question being that China has seen this as being an aggressive move. Indeed, Chinese state media, and uh, it's been reported in China that this makes Australia potentially a target as well. Right. I mean, look, I think, um, to be honest, I just think Australia is responding to China's previous behaviour. So since... Uh, uh, 2012, China's been building islands, militarising them. Uh, it's been bullying its, uh, the other claimant states in the South China Sea, using Coast Guard, militia, um, stopping countries like Malaysia that have been extracting oil in its close um, territorial waters um, from actually continuing to do what it's, they've done for, for decades. Um, so, actually, uh, the, the countries in Asia are very wary of China. Um, I think the countries of Asia actually look at the AUKUS deal as something that supports a balance of power in the region, which they want. And if Australia can make itself more capable through submarines, 
um, then the Asian countries in Southeast Asia are actually supportive of that. If that magnifies our capabilities, if it magn magnifies the capabilities of the United States, um, in order to provide a, a level of balance in the region. I think we should be a bit more careful with terminology here. Um, we're not really restoring the balance. We're maintaining the US supremacy in Asia. US currently has a supremacy in Asia, and it is challenged by China. It's true that China is ramping up defense spending. It is modernizing its military, and that is what is happening. But for a lot of uh, from the perspective of a lot of countries in Asia, the um, United States is not as a benign power as we see the United States. From a lot of countries, the United States is also another bullying great power, just like China. In fact, China and the United States both are bullying powers to them. So what they want to do is to ensure yes. there is a balance and they do not get trampled on while they compete. And do you think they would prefer that balance that's being struck the other way? They would prefer China? Because certainly, why is India now so interested in the Quad? Why is Japan so interested in it? Why is Vietnam getting so close to Australia? It's because they fear the alternative. But Chris, isn't, isn't, isn't it also the case, though, that a lot of those countries play both sides of the fence. I mean, India is a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organisation. It's a member of the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. Um, yes, there are tensions, obviously, between India and China. Japan, with its historical tensions with China, still enjoys a better relationship with China today than Australia does. Can we really count those countries in if push comes to shove when they're pursuing their own interests as well? Well, all nations will pursue their own interests in the end. And what the Australian government has been trying to do, and it may be doing it fitfully, it has recognised a threat and it is trying to deal with that threat at the moment. Everything that Australia has done has been to try and defend itself about what it sees as a perceived mm. threat, a real and perceived threat. And let's look at the ledger, because I keep trying to work out what it is exactly that Australia has done to so offend China that it would coerce us in such a way. They've occupied and militarised the South China Sea against pledges which they gave, that they would not do that to Barack Obama, in fact, uh, on the lawns of the White House. They, they've engaged in foreign interference inside our borders. I spoke this week to some Uyghurs who are, mm. who are frightened for their lives inside our borders. Now, imagine that. Imagine that there are citizens in Australia today who are concerned about what might happen to them, but even more so, what will happen to their families if they're seen to speak out. I've had the same conversations with people from Hong Kong. I'm sure you have as well. Mm. So there is a real and present danger. Australia, Australia is trying to respond to that danger. We are where we are because of the behaviour of China. And if China had just weaponised our apathy, they'd be doing a whole lot better now than they are. Well, on that question of weaponising, on that question of tension and potential conflict, our next question is Patrick uh, Rodier. At the National Press Club, Paul, Ke Paul Keating said Taiwan was not a vital interest of Australia and denounced AUKUS. Is protecting a fellow democracy in the Indo-Pacific strategically important to Australia and, in the instance of conflict, should we follow the US and militarily come to Taiwan's aid? James Patterson. I thought that statement by Paul Keating was a morally vacuous thing to say. Uh, it would be a very cruel and disappointing thing if Australia and our allies abandoned 24 million people who have their own vibrant liberal democracy and who have to be, their own self-determination has to be at the heart of any resolution of cross-straits tensions. And I think we should be very careful as an island nation and a liberal democracy of 25 million people that if we think that Taiwan doesn't matter to the world, why should we think that Australia matters to the world? Uh, the truth is that uh, avoiding a military confrontation over Taiwan is both the right thing to do and in Australia's national interest. And we're able to contribute in a meaningful way to the deterrence of military solutions to that problem. But Paul Keating's right, isn't he, um, when he says that Australia doesn't even recognise Taiwan. It recognises a one China. It doesn't recognise Taiwan. There's no alliance, as he says, there's no piece of paper setting out an agreement to defend Taiwan. Well, we recognise that China has a one-China policy and we maintain strong unofficial links with the Taiwanese and they are our ninth largest trading partner. And they are people who share uh, quite a lot of values uh, with Australia, a very strong value connection with Australia. And so I think it's very important that the United States, Australia, our allies, Japan and others do contribute to that credible deterrence for a military solution to that problem. Ed Husey, Xi Jinping has said very clearly and time and time again that he reserves the right to take Taiwan by force, would that then trigger a broader conflict that inevitably would involve Australia? Well, I think we, we should be working to avoid any 
uh, potential for military conflict there. Um, I do think we should have an interest in what happens to Taiwan uh, for a range of reasons. Uh, some of them have been mentioned in terms of the, uh, the trading partnership we have, but they're also one of the largest producers of semiconductors, the, mm. one of the most essential items in, in uh, electronic and tech all over the world. So uh, there is an interest in us maintaining uh, their ability to produce because of that economic uh, benefit that is derived from that and the importance that it has. So we do need to take uh, an interest in what happens there and I think we do need to take an interest in making sure that we de-escalate tension where we can uh, and that we don't see a military conflict break out over there. Was Paul Keating wrong to say that it is not in Australia's interests? D Taiwan is a democracy. Australia is a democracy. China is an authoritarian regime at a time when Joe Biden and others have recognised that this is a hinge point of history, that there is a retreating democracy in the world and a rising authoritarianism. Wouldn't defending a democracy be in Australia's interests? Well, I think I, I expressed a few moments ago, I think we should take an interest in this matter. Uh, I, but to actually you know, defend Taiwan, is that in Australia's interest if push came to shove, to actually support... If the if United we, States was involved, Australia would be involved. Would that not be in Australia's interest? I, I don't know what I'm doing to cause you to jump in all the time <laughs> on me. <laughs> I, I'm trying to, you know, uh, just express a few views. And I uh, just wanted to make the point. I think it is important that we take note what's happening there. And I do think it's important that we take the steps to ensure that the military, uh, that, that that sort of concern around the military action that may or may not eventuate, does not eventuate. We need to make sure that's the case. But that has to be, there has to be respect for Taiwan's position. Uh, there has to be a peaceful uh, recognition and respect of their, their position. Uh, and Australia can give voice to that. Uh, but it's, a, it's an issue of making sure too that like nations express that as well and make sure that people see common sense on this matter. This gives us some idea, though, of the, of the size of the problem that we're facing because of the pain that the political class will have to go through in coming to a decision like that, because as much as I disagree with a lot of what Paul Keating said, what conceivably can Australia do mm. by taking on China in Taiwan? What chance do we imagine we could possibly have there? Now, I'm not or, saying... Or, or I'm even, not saying or even the United States, potentially, the United States because of no the there. increased militarisation. And if that happened, like, th this is something we have to avoid at all costs. Because if there is an assault on Taiwan, do you think that they can leave the military bases in Japan alone? That, that they can assault Taiwan without taking out the nearest, biggest threat? So, to, to enter into this kind of thinking, mm. that, that this is a possibility, and this is a possibility, uh, is deeply dangerous and difficult stuff for Australia. And it, it poses huge moral questions, but also poses obvious practical ones. Ewan, it's, it's more than a possibility. Um, it is something that Xi Jinping is preparing for, isn't he? And he's already ramped up exercises uh, over Taiwan. He has said time and time again that he reserves the right to take Taiwan by force. And he's even set a timeline for this to happen. Yes, his messaging on Taiwan has been quite consistent with past... Uh, leaders of the People's Republic of China. And I think, you know, we, we need to think about the fact that Taiwanese people should have the right to determine their future. Taiwan is a democracy. It didn't used to be, um, but it transitioned to a democracy now. Um, but just from, but from Australia's national interest perspective, I guess we really need to think about what is our interest here. Um, for instance, when Russia uh, annexed Crimea, um, mm. The United States did not go to war with Russia. Um, we did not go to war with Russia. Um, so, you know, these kind of things can happen. Um, and we really need to think about what sort of circumstances is it happening in and what is it something that we can do. But in general, I think we should support uh, democracy. Um, that is Taiwan. And I think Taiwanese people should have the right to determine their future. But when you actually look at the survey, um, of Taiwan, what people in Taiwan actually want, um, they actually prefer status quo. They're not claiming for independence themselves either. Mm. Lavina, um, you yeah. raised a couple of really interesting points there, and that is the role of America in the world and the capacity for America to express that previously hegemonic power. We've seen America pull out of 
Afghanistan and the Taliban return. Um, Yun points out what happened after the annexation of Crimea. Barack Obama set red lines in Syria with the use of chemical weapons that he did not enforce. China's watching all of this, isn't it? And is, can Australia and American allies count on the US in a world where it cannot express its power to the extent that it once could? Um, look, I think um, you mentioned the withdrawal from Afghanistan um, and, a, and a general withdrawal of troops from the Middle East. I think there's a recognition that um, American foreign policy was misdirected towards the Middle East and the real contest is in the Indo-Pacific. And it's a bit belated, but we can, I think, take a bit of comfort that the Trump administration reoriented American foreign policy towards the Indo-Pacific, and that has continued under the Biden administration or appears to be continuing. Um, in terms of the, the Taiwan question, um, I think um, what I wanted to say about that conversation that we've, we've been having about it is that um, I think you're right that Xi Jinping is now reserving the right to take Taiwan by force and that Australia has agency in this, in this issue, in that if uh, the countries of the Indo-Pacific, if we don't show some uh, resolve about our willingness to defend Taiwan, that actually could encourage China to take its chances and actually go to war. So it's in our interest to actually uh, show support for Taiwan. Japan has showed support for Taiwan in saying that it would, in fact, come to Taiwan's aid. And I think what we also have to consider is that America is not a resident power in the Indo-Pacific. Um, China is a resident power. And the only way that America can project power in our region is through its alliances and the bases that it has in the Indo-Pacific, in Taiwan, in Japan. Um, not so much bases, but uh, capabilities in Australia, forward projection uh, support. And um, essentially, if Taiwan were to fall, then the United States will find it much harder to defend its allies in Japan. And um, it will then find it harder to project power in the Indo-Pacific, and that will affect Australia, And because America will not be able to play that balancing role just, as it once did. James Patterson, just quickly to the point that, that Chris Yulman raised, what could Australia do? Um, to go back to the submarines, what good would be um, submarines that we were getting by 2040, when by 2030, according to the Pentagon, China will have at least as many as 1,000 nuclear warheads? How on earth can we deal with that? Um, and what good is a submarine deal against China's increased might? Well, Stan, of course, uh, any one country on their own, and particularly a relatively small country like Australia, certainly couldn't deter a major power like China from doing what it wants. But in concert with our friends and allies, cumulatively, we can offer a very credible deterrence if we acquire the capability that we need and if we are clear about our intent. And the $270 billion that we're spending on new military capability over the next decade, plus the nuclear submarines, which we will uh, obtain by 2040, uh, will be a credible contribution that we can make to that collective but task. Not a, I don't but, suggest for but, a second but on our not, own. But not a credible um, deterrence to China. Well, I don't, I don't suggest for a second on our own, but cumulatively, with our allies and friends in the region, it does make a difference. And if we are all stand shoulder to shoulder on these issues, we stand a very good chance of averting this, of preventing this from happening and all the catastrophic consequences that would follow. And our next question comes from Steve Kai. Steve? Oh, sorry. There you are. <laughs> I live in Asia for about 18 years. Uh, from Singapore to Hong Kong and even in Shanghai, when I repatriated back down under, I was so appalled at the um, um, marginalizing of the Chinese here. Essentially, it's questioning our national pride uh, constantly. Now, most politicians say all the right same things, but their action often belies their voices. My question actually is directed at the two politicians on the panel. Mm. How will the two major political parties recover from the, um, uh, what I call the erosion in trust by the 1.2 million Chinese Aussies? Mm -hmm. so Steve, can I just ask you, you talk about the impact it's had on you and you've experienced this. What's been your experience? Uh, here in mm. Australia. 
Uh, do, you, do, are... do you feel as if there's been a, a, a palpable shift in this in recent times? It's very subtle, but it's very relentless. And I like to see some leadership from the politicians mm. there. Uh, uh, the example in that direction would be, uh, for example, on the liberal side, the Senator Eric uh, uh, Albert, um, mm. he um, questioned a Chinese well, Aussie. Ju just on that, the person in question is sitting next to me right now, Yun Jiang. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. take, us, take us through that experience and just quickly explain what happened. So uh, there was a the parliamentary inquiry into uh, diaspora issues, and I put in a submission for that, um, emphasising the fact that there is an increasing suspicion of uh, Chinese Australians as well as generally Asian Australians in Australia due to the foreign interference debate. And I underscore the point that uh, we should not um, put a higher bar for Chinese Australians to express their loyalty than other Australians. Um, I was invited, very happily, I was invited to be at, uh, in front of the hearing. Um, and when I got there, I realised that they were not actually... Um, they were actually not interested in hearing what I wanted to say about, uh, you know, the increasing suspicion of Chinese Australians. But what they want to know is whether I would denounce the Chinese Communist Party. And, How did uh, that make you feel? It was a very strange question. It came out of nowhere. I was very surprised. I was wondering whether the same questions was asked for everyone else was or it? was it just me? No, it was only asked to the three Chinese Australians that was there and it was not asked okay. for it other people. James Patterson, how is that acceptable? Uh, Stan, I think that was an unfortunate episode because I don't think it was Eric Abetz's intention to suggest that Yun or any other Chinese Australian is anything other than a, a fully uh, welcome uh, participant in Australia's democracy and is that, fully is, entitled is, is, how, how did to you whatever feel views. You, did, did, did you feel as if you were being, your allegiance was being questioned? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. J James, well, Yun felt that way. Yeah, and, and I, I regret that. That is regrettable and it is counterproductive because it's vitally important that the 1.2 million uh, people of Chinese heritage in Australia feel fully part of Australia, part of our community, and of course they are. There's 200 years of migration from China to Australia and a great history of Chinese contribution to Australia. My own participation in these debates came out as part of a concern about the oppression that the Chinese diaspora in Australia faces from the Chinese Communist Party, and it is wrong and counterproductive for them to feel in any way excluded from Australian society. I just, well, sorry. So, I, I think we may, we may have lost your mic. Sorry, I'll keep interrupting you, Ed. I'm sorry, but I, right. I think we, we may have just lost your mic for a moment. We'll, we'll try okay. to fix that. Because I want to come I'll, back and address... And I'll, exactly, I'll, I'll come straight back to you. But you've made the point, Chris, as well, about, and you mentioned it before, but you might want to expand on that, about the feeling among Chinese Australians that, um, A, they're being pressured from China, but they're also being um, marginalised in Australia and made to feel as if their allegiance mm. is under question. Yeah, and look, and I can, I can understand how you feel only through the experience of one of the friends of mine, because we've been doing a lot of stuff on China since about 2015, or at least the Chinese Communist Party's interference in Australian politics is where <coughs> it began for me. Uh, and he raised with me the feelings that he had about that. And the problem that I have is, is that you can't stop talking about the fact that there is an issue with the Chinese Communist Party. And of course, Australia being a multiracial democracy uh, should invite everyone to be welcome within it. The thing I would say though is no one oppresses more Chinese people than the Chinese Communist Party and some of them inside our borders. So this is an issue, we have to address it. It's obviously extremely difficult. The interventions of people like Erica Betts are shameful and you know should be called out when they happen. But uh, we have to have the conversation. I don't know how we can avoid having the conversation. Do we have Ed's mic back? Is Ed's mic working again now? I think it's a plot, mate. OK, there you go, Ed. <laughs> and, 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 of course, in, in your electorate as well, in Western Sydney, it's a, a particularly multicultural electorate. Do you get a sense that people are feeling, as, as Steve said, marginalised and victimised? Well, as soon as you said that, my ears pricked up. I mean, as a son of migrants myself and parents who came out and, you know, they wanted their kids to fit in, do well, you know, be able to contribute, uh, the minute, like, it's very hard for people to understand what it feels like the minute your loyalty to your country that you have grown up in and you're trying to do the right thing in is questioned. So as soon as you said that, I instantly, I, I felt, I, I felt, or well, I knew exactly how that um, feels because I've had that myself. I, and I've had 
as well. I'm not saying this about, about James. I mean, we may have differences, but I've got, got regard for him. But there have been other Liberal politicians and ex-politicians who've tried to do that on the basis of faith. And, and for people that, when we've had tensions, mm. they've raised that. So it's not all Liberals, I might add, but there are some who want to play that game. And uh, it, it's just wrong. This is at a time where we need to bring people together and to work as one on one of the biggest... This is, for our generation, mm. what's happening in terms of vis-a-vis -vis China is one of the biggest foreign policy challenges our, our country faces. We don't need to be split inside. We need to be as one here and working with others in the region, secondly, as well. So well, I definitely feel that, that point. What do you think, Ed, contributes to this climate at the moment? Chris made the point that we still need to have the conversation. But if you look at the headlines now, and Paul Keating is being accused of being an apologist and Chairman Paul and whatever the headlines say, um, you've raised the point earlier that people who raise a dissenting view are now accused of being China apologists. Mm. And if you're Chinese, like Ewan, you are then accused of being a Chinese agent, potentially, mm. as well. What's contributing to this moment and why are we seeing such a, a hardened us and them type of rhetoric and reporting around this? So, I appreciate on the one level, as I said a few moments ago, this is like one of the toughest tests we face as a country. One. So, in that environment, you can understand... People, people have a choice that they can make to have a clear eye view about what we need to do as a nation and how we go about that and are we doing things that build alliances, bring people along on this or not? And for some people, they, they may misplace uh, that, the, the tension that is created out of that situation in that way that I think is completely unproductive. But we do need to recognise we're up against a different China now. Mm. We're not dealing with the China that a lot of previous, that, you know, previous generations of politicians had dealt with, particularly at that phase where uh, they wanted economic engagement, China wanted prosperity and wanted to do that well that way. Now China is much more aggressive and assertive on the world stage. That, that is putting challenges on us all. And the way we're going to get through this is to be clear on our national, national imperatives, uh, to also celebrate the value of the alliance that we have with the US and what that brings within the region, to work closer with people and, and our neighbours in the region, principally ASEAN, but also in terms of, uh, if you look at Indonesia, Singapore and others, working closer uh, within our region as well and bringing people together on that. That mindset drives... That will drive a mentality that will see less of the, mm. the targeting of people and more of the building of the coalition that we need, as I said, to deal with one of the toughest challenges we face. Steve... I um... think also the way the debate is conducted is, True. shall I say, suboptimal. Um, you know, people talk about a Chinese influence uh, without distinguish between the country or the people. And then there's also talks about an invasion. All that is quite harmful. And, of course, the toxic toxicity around, you know, imputing people's intention based on their political view. You know, we're living a democracy. I should have the right to um, criticise my government and should ev so should everyone here. And I should not be told that uh, because I criticise my government, therefore I am an agent of a foreign country. I think that's just uh, unacceptable. Steve, just, just quickly, just to Chris's point, do you believe that we can have this conversation without the feelings of people like yourself that you're being marginalised? Um, I think the, the jury's still out. I, I can't quite... Um, I can't feel it at the moment. I can't... Yeah. Well, we, we're certainly having the conversation we here. Are, we are, because we are in a, in a liberal d democracy. Mm. You Indeed. understand. Yeah. Can, uh, Stan, may I just add, uh, with Ed's uh, comment there, right, I, I had a go at S Senator Eric Albert, but also Labor just can't get away with it too. The, the saga of parachuting Christina Connelly into the seat of Fowler, you know, that, 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 that's not a good move uh, in favour against uh, a local Asian... I might just get a quick, uh, quick response to that from Ed. Well, we're talking about a liberal democracy and we can disagree. OK. <laughs> She's an immigrant too. Um, but so, well, the, well the I mean, I think the broader... But if I can say, like, I, I've spoken very much in favour of Christine. I think she'll be a terrific candidate, right? I understand your point of view. But I think there's a bigger thing about diversity in Australian politics that needs to be tackled. It won't be sorted by one seat. 
this is going to need parties to deal with this, particularly major parties, okay. in a much more serious way. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for the question. Our next question comes from Seja Alzaide. Hi. So, given that TikTok is a tool that's been deployed by China and is having an immense amount of negative effects on young Australians in particular, do you think that the government should look at interventionary measures with this app? It's evidently causing a huge amount of negative side effects for Australians both young and old, and it's funneling a tremendous amount of our data back to Beijing. Senator Josh Hawley in the US stood up against TikTok and actively voiced his views on the fact that this app could be a security threat. So will and when will the Australian government step in and intervene? James Patterson. I would urge all Australians to be careful with all social media platforms and the data that you give them, but also to be particularly careful with those that are headquartered in China, uh, even those that are owned by ostensibly private companies like ByteDance, as TikTok is, uh, because in reality there is no such thing as a strictly private company in China. And Jack Ma used to think he was running a private company in Alibaba and he learnt the hard way that he wasn't. Uh, all large Chinese enterprises essentially serve the objectives of the Chinese Communist Party or they wouldn't be allowed to exist. And so we should be very mindful of that. Uh, in terms of Australian government response to that, I think we've demonstrated on a bipartisan basis over about a decade that, if necessary, we are willing to step in and ban high-risk vendors, for example, in the rollout of the NBN and 5G, like Huawei and ZTE. And if it's necessary to do the same with TikTok, then I don't think we'll hesitate to do it. Uh, Lavina Lee, one of the things that um, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute that you're, you're associated with um, has been calling for is a, a national threat assessment, isn't there, in Australia? That, and how would that include things like this, like TikTok or like cyber? Perhaps, you know, we talk a lot about conflict with Taiwan, we talk a lot about submarines and about heavy weaponry, but there's also a cyber aspect to this increasing tension, rivalry, Cold War, cyber war, whatever you want to call it. Um, well, you know, I think cyber um, warfare now is considered the, the fifth domain of warfare. Um, so before it used to be considered part of other domains of warfare, but now it's quite distinct. And I think um, when you mentioned AUKUS, I, I think that's another a thing that we don't consider about AUKUS. We focus so much on submarines. But um, the other benefit of AUKUS is actually cooperation with two really high technology countries, um, the United States and the United Kingdom, um, collaboration on fighting cyber warfare, um, but not just defending against cyber warfare, but potentially actually using it offensively um, in, in a war situation. Um, but I think, I think you're right um, that we, we have to be aware of um, things like TikTok, the, the gathering of data, uh, regulating what data can actually be used for, facial recognition technology, which uh, could be very useful in, in a lot of, of circumstances, but have really untoward effects on um, democracies and the ability of, of governments to surveil us without our knowledge. So, um, yes, I think that this is a, is a really big part of uh, the conversation that should be yeah. had, um, that it's not all about submarines, it's not all, all about military, it's actually that um, the, 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 the challenges of the future are actually here and present in Australia now through, through the cyber threat. The clock's ticking. I want to get to a couple more questions before we wrap up tonight. Next one comes from Ben Thatcher. Thanks, Dan. Uh, my question's a bit lighter uh, in relation to electric vehicles. Um, our Prime Minister, before the last election, came in pretty hard anti pickup of electric vehicles in Australia. In the last couple of days, he seemed to have backflipped and has uh, gone against his previous claims of ending the weekend, not towing a boat, and now he has decided that some sort of great technological advance has driven party room decisions to now pick up EVs and, and it's the way forward for Australia. Uh, I want James Patterson to please explain what's happened in the party room in the last 18, 19 months that's completely changed the thinking of the LNP. There's no longer a war on our weekend, apparently, James. <laughs> Well, in that uh, press conference in the Prime Minister was very critical of Bill Shorten's proposed policy, he also said that we don't discourage Australians from buying electric vehicles. In fact, if that's your choice, go ahead and do it. But what, what, but what we're going to lose our utes, I think, was one of the slogans mm. at the time. Well, well, I was just going to say, Stan, there have been some significant advances in electrical vehicle technology. And one of the most remarkable is that Ford in the United States is offering an electric 
powered pickup uh, vehicle, which I don't think any people would have foreseen three or four years ago. Uh, prices have come down, ranges have become extended. Um, it is taking over and that's a positive thing and I'm really excited about the future. Ed Hughes, you must be excited as well. I mean, you've been a great proponent of oh, I'm electric so glad You must be very pleased. Been ended. You must be very oh, pleased so that Scott it's Morrison has taken the thing. pledge. I mean, he, on so many instances, Scott Morrison just plainly denies what he has said. I mean, and he made this point. He said the weekend would be ended by, by EVs, that, you know, wouldn't be able to tow your caravan and wouldn't be able to do all this. And, and the rest of the world just got on with it. And, and, and started working this. And we needed to attend to things like range anxiety, and we needed... Would it, wouldn't it have been great to be able to manufacture EVs in Australia if we didn't chase out our car makers, if we got our act together on batteries um, and had found a way to create a new manufacturing opportunity that has now opened up because of the way that EVs are, are being uh, manufactured in different parts of the world, and they find it easier now to have a devolved manufacturing model um, and we've had this massive U-turn, and, and, and the, I'll just end on this point. We have so many wasted fights and wasted years because the Coalition wants to extract political points on stuff that really makes no sense. We just get on with it. I don't know what to read into Chris Yulman's... <laughs> There's a little bit of applause there. I don't know what to read into Chris Yulman's facial expressions. No, no, it's, it's you're a, also I said a new term... I said a new term... I said a new term, range anxiety. Range anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> There's something else to get anxious about in the world. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> but here I am worrying about the wrong things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like interesting we, we're talking about Taiwan, which should be range anxiety. <laughs> um, our last question comes from Glenn Gibson. So, so, sorry, Glenn, <laughs> you're rushing a microphone to you, sorry. Right. Thank you. If former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd was able to help us with a Pfizer vaccine and former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull was able to help us with climate action, is it possible former Prime Minister Kevin... Uh, sorry, uh, Paul Keating would be able to help us with uh, Chinese... To well, I, I think I know what Chris Newman's answer to this. He's already given this, this <laughs> bit. What do we do with former Prime Ministers, Chris? I don't know what we do as former Prime Ministers, but, um, but I think Paul Keating's entirely wrong. He said China's not a threat. Well, I have a list in front of me that was handed to my colleague, Jonathan Kersley, last year. It's a list of 14 demands of Australia that was handed to him by a Chinese official. Uh, and it was backed in by the Foreign Ministry and by the Chinese media. And among the things that it asked for is... It complains about the fact that Chinese companies have been stopped from foreign investment, that we banned Huawei from the rollout of our 5G, that we call for an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19, and ends up with the things that our MPs and our papers say. So if you don't believe that there is a clear and present danger or that there is a threat from China, then you are either delusionally or, delusional or willfully blind. There, there is the question, we've talked a lot about China, but there is the question, I, I think, Lavina, um, about, you know, the, the worth and value of former Prime Ministers. Paul Keating had played a significant role in Australian life, Kevin Rudd, Malcolm Turnbull. What do we do with former Prime Ministers and what role do they have? We could stuff them. <laughs> <laughs> they may say the same thing about journalists. Oh, pretty so cool, <laughs> uh, was that on my face? <laughs> <laughs> you that? Uh, mate, you've got I read your mind. Thank Thanks, you, Lavina. my friend. Are you worry about how far you can go? <laughs> I think some are obviously more constructive than others. I, I disagree with Paul Keating, but I think he is a, a considered person and he obviously thought uh, he needed to insert himself into the public debate and I think he did, did so thoughtfully and I can respectfully question mm. his assumptions and disagree with him. Well, um, I would say, though, that I think that, uh, Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull's interventions of late have not been very helpful um, to Australia. I think um, uh, Turnbull's uh, interventions on the AUKUS submarine deal, his uh, support for Macron, um, I think there's a, a confusion there between his own uh, emotional well-being um, and the national interest. Without... Um, yes. Yeah, we, we, without, we're almost out of time, but without playing politics too much, Ed and, and James, um, you'd have to get out of the Senate, James, but perhaps one day... Both of you may be in a position of being former Prime Ministers. I, I, I don't know, but what role should former Prime Ministers have, Ed and then James? Q &A. Um, <laughs> uh, well, can I just say... Just Hood ornaments. <laughs> on an electric vehicle. Can I just say, 
Well, did you not hear Paul Keating say he recognised, he acknowledged that there was an authoritarian... He said China was not a threat to Australia. hang on. He said China was not a threat to Australia. He said China was not a threat to Australia. And he also refer, re, referred to the fact that he'd been in Beijing and said to their face that they needed to deal with things differently. Well, he didn't call and Xi Jinping so, coconut And the other yet, thing, that, as he the did other thing that's Johnson. important... Well, yeah, that was probably a bit... Anyway. Yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> but I would make the point, just picking up on the other... Yeah, he's injected elements into the debate to make people think and to take that on board. You don't have to agree with everything, but I do think... And he's one of the siren this, voices on the billionaires we've, and the vice we've been at this for a, We've been at this for an hour and we'd probably be here for another hour if we, if we, if we keep going. Uh, <laughs> the ABC might. Um, <laughs> Turn his mic back off. <laughs> and and I, I don't know. Are you going to answer my question, James? We're almost out of time. What do we do with former Prime Ministers? Are they of any use? Number one, Stan, Paul Keating is literally the last Australian I would send to China to represent our interests. <laughs> Number two, to take one He's from the side of politics, uh, there are former Prime Ministers who make a very positive contribution. Look at the way that Julia Gillard and John Howard have conducted themselves since they lost office. They have behaved in an exemplary way and they set the example for everyone else. Well, you've, you've <laughs> almost taken us right up to the minute. Thank you so much for that. That's all we have time for. Thanks again to our panel, Yun Jung, Chris Ullman, Ed Husick, Lavina Lee and James Patterson. And it's so, it's so good to hear clapping again in the room. So thank you to your, our audience as well, and uh, it's, it's good to have you back. Next week, David Spears will be with you live from Melbourne looking at the great resignation, apparently. Are Australian workers preparing to leave their jobs in droves as we embrace a post-pandemic work life? But there'd be some answers to that here. They're still talking under their breath. <laughs> Joining the panel, journalist George Megalogenis, health expert Jane Holton, Telstra CEO Andy Penn, founder of the Equality Institute, Emma Fulu, and musician and disability advocate Eliza Hull. If you'd like to join the audience, head to our website, abc.net.au slash quanda. We're going to continue the conversation <laughs> offset, I'm sure. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.